Hi. In this video, I improve on the free running CPU by dedicating a no op instruction and creating all of the control signals for that. I drop in some ROM memory and address that to address zero and use that to drive the fetch register, which then turns around and drives the instruction register. So I end up ultimately with a more refined, if you will, free running CPU. Let's get right into it. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm building a 16-bit computer from scratch. I hope you'll join me on this journey. Okay, so today I'm zoomed in on my temporary memory module, and while it was cute for a little while, it's time to start expanding this out a little bit. And one of the things in my build is I'm actually going to be able to access 128 kilobytes of memory with just a 16-bit address. The way I'm going to do that is that every single memory access is going to be 16 bits wide, which means that I'm going to have both the least significant and a most significant byte that is going to be read, and they're going to be read concurrently. This is ground pin here. Flip it up this way so you can see it. This is the ground pin here. One, two, and three pins here are used for data and those match up with the five pins up here. And so what my plan is, is to bring these three uh, signals around to here so that I can drop them in place. So I want to leave two rows available up on top and three on the bottom. And the reason I want to do that is because I'm going to have more signals I'm going to deal with on the bottom side of the IC. That is not feeling right. Yeah, it looks okay the bottom of the IC versus the top of the IC. This one did not happen right. And if you can see, I managed to bend, I managed to bend the pin here. So I've got to kind of bend it back into place. And that's the problem with these EE proms the way that they are. I need to get some more ZIF sockets, but they're quite pricey. So let's try this again. Okay, and hopefully those will survive. And then I'm going to go ahead and stick a, uh, uh, either up here or up here, I'm going to stick one of those uh, pin diagrams so that you can follow along with me. And the first thing to hook up here is power. And I'm going to need power. So the uh, build is not powered at the moment. Power and ground go in first. Oh, it's a little bit too tight. Okay, power and ground. So that takes care of my opposite corners there. Now the next thing line he, along here is right enable. That's an active low signal. I'm going to pull that high because I don't want anything to be writing to my EE prom while it's in the build. I'll do that out of the build. It's too slow anyway for what I'm hoping to do. So we'll bring those high and we'll do those independently. Next thing along is address 13, which I do want to tie together. And so address 13 and address 13 will work in conjunction with each other, but I'm going to tie those low because for the moment, for the moment, I don't want to use those. Next along is address 8, and it's going to be very much the same thing. I'm just going to tie it, tie them together and pull that low as long as I have some of these longer pre-cut segments here. Next one along is address 9, and we're going to do the same thing with that. Sorry for my head getting in the way. I hate to say it, but you've got a better vantage point than I do. Next one along is address 11. Do I have something that's long enough to fit there? I do not. No, I'm not seeing it. So I will use temporary for now until I can cut some more wires. Okay, the next one along is output enable. And eventually, I believe I'm going to need to control that because I'm gonna have a mix of ROM and RAM at some point. And so I want to be able to optionally disable that. But for now, I'm gonna just go ahead and tie it low. Output enable is an active low signal. Next one is address line 10 which like all the others, I'm going to tie together and tie that low because I'm not going to use that quite yet. The next one along is chip enable. And chip enable, I want to tie both of those low, just tie them low directly because those are never going to change. If I want to have 
either of these two EE proms output, I can either bring the output enable low or the chip enable low. And it is my recollection, I can't recall perfectly, but it's my recollection that the chip enable takes longer to get to the output than the output enable does. In other words, if I bring the out output enable low, the outputs show up at a faster time than if I was to bring chip enable low. So I want to tie chip enable low and use the faster of the two. The last thing I want to do is take address line two and bring it up to here. I'm sorry, I said address. I meant IO line two, IO line one, and IO line zero. And bring those up so that I have in a row IO line zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven all lined up. And the whole point of that is to be able to take this and drop it in right here. And now I've got my outputs going right up into my fetch register up here, which is right off screen up here at the top. I want to do the same thing over here. Two, one, and I'm looking for one more blue. I don't have it, so I'll substitute in a green and zero. And again, for my least significant byte, that's going to drop right in here. Now, effectively, what I've got is I've got a 16-bit memory operation based on a 17-bit address where the bottom bit, the least significant bit, is always set to zero. And think about that for a minute. If this would be whatever the value is on the address line here, if this was byte zero and byte one, and I'm always reading in 16 bits like this, that gives me the 128 bytes of memory that I need. It's a 17-bit address, but my bottom bit is always tied low because I'm always reading 16 bits at a time. Let me get this cleaned up a little bit so we can uh, move on and do some more work here. Now, while I'm working on this, you may be asking, why am I tying all these address lines low? It seems uh, counterproductive when I've got all these address lines over here that are ready to be used. And the answer to that question is simple. I'm really just trying to limit the number of bytes that I have accessible on the EEPROM in the short term. Uh, in the long term, I am going to expand that out as I have more to do, but right now, the only instruction that I really want to be able to execute is a no-op instruction. A no-op instruction takes one byte. After that, I'm going to work on trying to load a register with a value, and that would be two bytes, or I could expand that to possibly four bytes. The whole point here being that it makes it a little bit easier for me to write some code that uses just a few of the uh, memory addresses and have that loop quickly rather than running through all 600, 536 different memory addresses to get back around or even, uh, even still have to program that same instruction to iterate 65,536 times. So by limiting the addresses that I'm having here and expanding them out as I need to, it's going to make things work a little bit easier for me for testing and debugging. Okay. Well, it was incredibly fussy to get these to lay flat, but I've got my upper, when I say upper, I mean the ones that are on top of the IC. I've got my upper address lines and control line pulled over 
so that it's easy to extend these into my address bus connection here. I've got the eight address lines that are down here. Actually, there's 10 address lines that are down here, zero through seven, which are all in a row, and then 12 and 14. So I'm gonna extend those over here and again, tie them all down to zero or ground so that my only address that I'm being read on both of these is address zero. And of course, you can probably predict I'm gonna stuff a no op in there. Okay, it's the next day here, and today I'm gonna to tackle getting these bottom address lines hooked up. They're gonna look very similar to what I did up on top, except I managed to cut some wires while I was bored at work today. All right, so address lines 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then 12 and 14 are here. And then I just need to jump those together from the most significant byte to the least significant byte. So that is the expansion of the memory module. And right now I have effectively one usable byte of memory. The next thing is, is to be able to program these two EE proms with an actual program. For that, I need an assembler. Okay, so I needed an assembler. I quite like what James Sharman demonstrated in one of his earlier videos. I'll have a link to that up in the cards and I'll also link to it in the description. I have not seen his code, but I do like the idea that he presented in that video and I copied it. The code is mine. Um, the implementation is mine, uh, but I can't uh, take credit for the idea. That's all his. So what I have done is I have built a scanner. A scanner was done using Flex, meaning that I have uh, several things that will be matched and then several things that will be returned. And depending on what kind of a state, initial state that the scanner is in when it starts scanning any particular thing is how it's going to handle that information. I've also got a parser. The parser was handwritten. Uh, it was not done with Bison or Yak or anything like that. It is a hand-coded top-down parser. I believe it qualifies as a L-A-L-R-1 parser. Uh, look ahead, uh, left to right, with one look ahead token. And so this file handles the majority of that. I've got things related to memory, opcodes, registers, uh, handling labels, handling errors, handling the binary itself, and then a couple of uh, uh, additional support functions here in ASM.C. I'm going through this very quickly. I realize that I'll give you a link to the GitHub repository where I've got this all posted and ready to go. Most important here is my architect architecture definition file. And this is the piece that I get from James's implementation is he went out and made it very configurable so that each architecture could, basically it was a, a platform agnostic or a target agnostic assembler where all you do is you define a new architecture and it would go out and assemble according to those rules. So I have a couple of things that I've put in mind. For example, I have a 16-bit organization. So everything that this computer does is, my build anyway, is in 16 bits. Most computers handle everything in 8 bits. Sometimes they get into other, you know, multiples. You've got to be uh, word aligned and et cetera for performance improvements. But I don't have a choice of reading a single byte in my architecture. So I wanted to make sure that I could call that out in the assembler. And this is the directive that allows me to do that. Now, multiple implementations or multiple instances of 16 bits, such as a 32-bit long value is going to be implemented in implemented in little Indian order. And so the 16 bits themselves are going to be treated like a byte such that they are in big Indian order, if you will. And I put that in quotes here indicating that I'm kind of making up a term. 
but bits 0 through 15 would be in the same order in which a single byte would be with the most significant bit being on the left. The 16 bits are read together as one unit. And that's the lowest common denominator I've got on my build. Then I've got memory. I've got memory that goes from 0 to 7 FFF. And I've called that ROM. And I've got additional memory I'm intending from 800 to FFFF. And I'm calling that RAM. Now each one of these memory locations is... 16 bits. And then something I have to do in the future is instruct the assembler how to break things up if it's going to output uh, ROMs or binaries. There could be, in, like as in my case, I'm going to split them up into a least significant byte and a most significant byte for the implementation. And you saw that on the breadboards. And now for the opcodes. I'll put a picture back up on the screen to remind everybody, but my instruction word. Uh, is going to be broken up into several parts. The most significant four bits are going to be conditional instructions, meaning that if a condition is met, that con instruction is executed. And if that condition is not met, then an opcode would be passed on to execute the appropriate instruction. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for no op to be conditioned. And I get that, but it shows you all of the different possibilities that could take place on any given instruction. For example, I've got just a simple no op here, which is 16 bits, 0, 0, 0, 0. I've got a no op that always occurs, which is the same thing as just no op. But a no op that never occurs would always fail the evaluation and then therefore would always pass no op on to the instruction register or to be the actual byte that's executed and from that perspective uh it doesn't make sense to really have that instruction but i wanted to demonstrate all the different possibilities that are going to happen for each of the 256 variations of instructions that i can actually have on the system uh conditioned by the most significant four bits of the instruction word and then driven to the destination of the least significant bits of the destination word. Least significant four bits, I should say. These four bits here represent the conditioning, and these four bits here represent the value that's going to be asserted onto the main bus, and then potentially even latched at the end, where it's going to be latched. From that perspective, this looks convoluted, but I'm hoping it makes some sense. I've kind of taken the ARM conditional execution as my inspiration for these. So that then allows me to assemble some code. So let me bring up my first set of code here. So this then is an assembly file that I'm going to be building on the 16-bit computer from scratch architecture. And my memory starts at zero, and then it has a single entry here called no op. And so when I assemble this, what it's done out here is it's written this output.bin. It's also broken it up into least significant and most significant bytes up here in the corner. And I've got right now a hard-coded hack to do that. It's not driven by anything in the architecture file that says to do that. And then I've got this listing that actually gets produced and written out to the screen. And this parameter here says give me the listing to standard out. Here's the listing of this assembled code. And you notice that the bits here or the 16-bit word here at this location is a no op instruction or all zeros. So I can write the least significant bits byte EEPROM or and the most significant byte EEPROM and drop those into my build and it will read the no op instruction that I've coded in here and pass that along. At the same time I had to do some updates to the control ROM and what I did is I split out the instruction no op so that it, I can generate the values for no op 
independent of everything else. Now, it just so happens to not have any material change in the output. But what this does is it now sets me up for additional instructions to be dropped in here. And I have put an enum up here of all the different instructions that I'm going to have. Notice that the, well, and I have a bug here. So I'm gonna to have to get this fixed and uploaded before um, I push this video out. So remember the instruction itself is the middle eight bits and the lower four bits are inconsequential. The upper four bits indicate the flags that are going to be used in order to control things. And when I say flags, I'm not really referring to things coming off the ALU. I'm worrying, I'm, I'm considering other things like, are we in interrupt mode or not? Or do we have the return address and the program counter swapped for any reason? Those are the types of flags that I'm referring to. And again, with that instruction uh, slide up in the corner here, you can see how I'm trying to organize what those instructions look like. So I guess I've got some work to do to get this cleaned up. Now what I did is I did make a change to the make file so that the default for make is to do everything. Everything is built on or is dependent on build. Build actually builds the executable, but then once it's been built, it executes it, which actually writes this control one dot bin, which uh, if I look at this control one dot bin was updated at the same time as the EEPROM executable was. You can see that down here. So let's get this written onto EEPROM and update everything and let's give it a test. Okay, so the next step here is to get these programmed. And so I'm gonna start by writing the control ROM. Okay, next up is going to be the RAM, least significant bytes. Sorry, ROM, least significant bytes. And then the most significant byte. Okay, so one thing that I am looking at here is I see that both ROMs were written 64K, and so I've got to check that. Yep, that's a problem. So I got a bug somewhere in my code that I've got to go clean up. Let me go do that. Try it again out in a minute. Okay, so maybe third time's the charm. First time I mistakenly had a bug in my code that was cutting up the EE proms into different uh, sizes. I had to correct that. Second time the phone rang, which is annoying. Let's do this for the third time and maybe we can get it done correctly this time. The control ROM here. All right, brilliant. Next up is the least significant bytes of my ROM memory. So 32K, that's good. And the last step is going to be the most significant bytes of my ROM memory. Very good. All right, let's get these back into the uh, build and give it a test. Okay, so the control ROM goes up here and I wanna make sure I get this all lined up properly. And zooming in here, probably in post, I'm not going to do it right now. I've got to make sure that the power lines up here and that the ground lines up over here before I set this in. It's not powered currently. And then for my memory down here, which is what we are building today, I need to do the same thing, making sure that power up here is on the power pin that's there. Most significant bytes. And same thing with the least significant bytes okay so now if we plug it in which i've got power up off the screen here plug it in it should start running and here is my program counter 
pulling in a no op instruction which is all zeros and displaying the no op instruction here which is all zeros kind of lackluster here but what you do see is that it actually is executing again this is free running except i've got a single instruction for well 16 instructions for no op but a single op code that i'm going to use for no op that can be decorated with conditions 16 different conditions but this is running and incrementing and i'm not doing anything it's controlled specifically by the logic that's here in the control rom okay so for the next video here i'm going to integrate this pcb into the mix this is going to be my register r1 and i'm going to expand the address space on this memory module out to five bits from zero bits at least five bits i may go more than that and then I want to create a move instruction that allows me to move a constant value in from the uh, instruction stream. And that move will be targeted for R1. So I've got a little bit of work to do to do that, meaning I'm going to have to take the bottom four bits of this instruction here and be able to target that it is the destination of the move. So that's going to have to be flushed out as well. So this could probably stem over a couple of videos as I try to get all of this working. I still have some PCB work to do, which means I've got some KiCad work to do, and I've got a few other things on my to-do list. So lots of things to be done. Thank you. We'll see you soon.